Hello again. This week I tackle a timely and difficult question. Why do so few colleges do widespread repeating testing for COVID-19? Let's take a look. I chose to respond to this question because when I shared it with some friends, all of them thought it was based on a false premise. Surely colleges are testing everyone, they said. No. Colleges are not testing everyone. They're not even nearly testing everyone. Many are not even testing the majority of their students. And only a tiny fraction are testing all of their students repeatedly. And the reasons why are pretty interesting. More than a third of colleges in the United States ultimately allowed students to come back in the fall, offering some level of in-person classes and dorm occupancy. The results were pretty bad. Within weeks, many large universities had become major hotspots, not only dramatically increasing transmission rates among the students that they serve, but also causing increases in their communities. Most students are acting responsibly and following safety protocols, but schools clearly underestimated the number of students who would not follow guidelines or requirements and underestimated what would happen when those small groups became infected. It's the nature of a pandemic of a highly transmissible disease that it only needs a toehold to begin spreading. So first, let's just resolve the issue of how much colleges are testing. The California Institute of Technology did an analysis of fall reopening plans in the midsummer. They examined 500 schools and found that 54% plan to do some testing, 24% would be testing all undergraduates when they arrived at school, only 20% plan to do regular testing, and most of those were using a sampling method, not testing all students. The analysis found that most schools' choices were based on the Trump administration's health guidance, limiting testing only to symptomatic students. It's not clear how many schools substantially changed their testing protocols once the fall semester began, but it's fairly clear that few did. Some have made substantial changes. For example, in my home state of Kansas, Kansas State University will no longer be limited to students showing symptoms or who are known contacts of positive cases. As part of a testing expansion plan, any interested students can receive free tests, even if they are asymptomatic. But school surveys reveal, overall, few changes to testing strategies nationwide. Second, and more importantly, are the fateful consequences of failing to test. The data clearly shows that widespread frequent testing of both symptomatic and asymptomatic people with a fast turnaround of results is the most effective way to identify and stop potential outbreaks. Testing asymptomatic people turns out to be crucial because people infected with the coronavirus are most contagious before displaying symptoms, and up to 40% of infected people are asymptomatic, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. If you divide residential colleges in America into two categories, those with higher than average infection rates and those with lower than average infection rates, there's really only one thing that distinguishes them. That's testing. What do the results of widespread testing look like? You have Cornell College, one case, Amherst College, three cases, Duke University, 75 cases, which sounds like a lot until you remember they have 17,000 students, Colby College, 11 positives, the real number's even lower because some were false negatives, Wesleyan University, nine, Delaware State University, 15, Vassar Colleges, 31 positives, a fraction of a percent. The contrast between the schools that test and the schools that don't test is overwhelming. So to me, it's very interesting that testing isn't more prevalent. Speaking of interesting, if you think the material of this video is interesting, please let me know. It helps me decide what kind of content to produce. The best way to do it is to hit the like and subscribe buttons below, and don't forget to hit the notification bell so YouTube will let you know about new videos when they appear. So if the difference is so pronounced in favor of schools that widely test, why isn't testing ubiquitous? Well, the most obvious reason is cost, but it's more complicated than that. There are different types of tests. Some are more expensive than others. The nasal swab PCR test is generally considered preferable because of its accuracy, but it can sometimes take days to get a result and can cost up to $150 per test. Plus, because of the possibility of false negatives, which would allow an infected person to believe they're in the clear and go on spreading the disease, 
These tests ideally should be performed repeatedly, obviously increasing cost. So schools have offered cost as the reason they aren't engaging in widespread testing. But it's not as simple as that. First, it's possible to bring the cost of testing down, way down. Smaller schools can work cooperatively. If they commit to regular testing, they can enter into a group rate with an independent lab because the regular testing offers a guaranteed number of incoming tests for the lab, and doing it with a group of schools brings the total volume of guaranteed tests up and allows the lab to achieve an economy of scale. For example, the Broad Institute, a large lab affiliated with Harvard and MIT, is offering what is essentially a group rate to 100 small colleges in New England. The tests are only around $25, and they offer overnight results. And which colleges are using that pooled service? Exactly the same small colleges that I mentioned at the outset of this video that, not by coincidence, also have very low rates of infection. Larger schools as well have re re reduced their cost by doing the tests in-house in their own labs. And once again, the schools that are using their own facilities to test frequently have, for the most part, kept transmission rates low. So adequate testing is within the means of many schools, not just because the cost of the test can be driven down, but because schools are spending large amounts of money on other things besides testing. If the closest correlation is between transmission and testing, then non-testing expenditures are essentially a decision by the school to spend money on less effective mitigation measures. Resources should be allocated to the most effective measures, and that's doubly true in the case of publicly funded schools or schools that accepted public money to help deal with the pandemic. Schools have an incentive to look like their efforts are comprehensive, but in fact, many expenditures not related to testing just siphon money from measures that have been shown to be effective. But there's another reason, besides appearances, why schools don't test. As we all know, Many schools are struggling financially, and that has created an incentive for schools to spend stimulus money on items not because they're effective, but because they are budget relieving. I know of a fair number of schools who took stimulus money, applied it to existing salary lines to ease their budgets, and then changed the titles of those jobs so there was, or at least appeared to be, a COVID relationship. Most of the schools that did this have something in common. They're struggling financially. I hope this information has been helpful to you. If you haven't had a chance to listen to this week's podcast, my guest was behavioral specialist Dr. Jennifer Howell of the University of California, Merced, who discussed with me why the push to blame students ignores both context and best practices. I enjoyed it, and I think you will too. I'll put a link to it below. I hope you're well, and I look forward to talking with you again next week.